Kevin McCled and Britt helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com. Industrial plants were in the news this week. In St. John Parish, residents are complaining that a chemical produced there is causing cancer. And in eastern New Orleans, there are strong feelings on both sides about a proposed gas-fired power plant. We'll look at those stories tonight, as well as allegations of sex trafficking, the latest on the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Race. Our Future Watch segment examines street repairs, or lack thereof. And in sports, there are sellouts at LSU's Maravich Assembly Center for a nationally ranked powerhouse. Not basketball, but who would have thought women's gymnastics. On the mat for us are tonight's Informed Sources. Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4. Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. And Kevin Litton, reporter, NOLA.com. The Times Picayune, and we go over to Kevin first because the city council, the city council committee, uh, gave a 4-1 approval of a go-ahead for a new energy power plant to be built out in Michu, where there's a, a, a facility there that's no longer uh, in service. This whole thing has been long in the making, and it's really stirred a lot of controversy. Yeah, this started really back in 2016 when that Michu plant that you mentioned in uh, New Orleans East, they had a couple of uh, power generation devices out there that were able to generate power during times of peak usage, and they were also able to power it up if there had been a storm that would knock out um, some um, transmission lines mm -hmm. that were coming into the city. Once those were powered down, and they, they took them down because they were antiquated, they were very difficult and expensive to maintain, the city council had been looking at the possibility of doing local power generation for a while. Because when you don't have it, if the transmission lines go down, there's seven that come into the city, we're, all, we're surrounded on three sides by water, it's very difficult to get power from other areas. Mm -hmm. So they're very concerned that both uh, peak times, when it's people are getting home from work in the summertime and they're trying to cool the house down, uh, periods of cold when they um, are powering up their um, electric furnaces, those kinds of things, that they want to be able to meet demand on that side and then also when those transmission lines go down if there was to be a major catastrophe a Katrina like event then you would be able to generate power locally it's worth noting I think that um, in Katrina Mishu sites that site did flood so when we were out of power here for so long after Katrina one of the reasons was because that Mishu site could not power up in addition to all of the problems that they had with the distribution and transmission problems after Katrina so opponents say no 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 we, we should be looking at other sources and this is going to be a pollutant etc and really expensive but those are the proponents say none of that is really the case. Yeah, and I think you know a lot of the opponents were trying to make the case that the numbers were really not on energy side when they were looking at this. The load forecasts, which show how much uh, energy that we're uh, consuming on an annual basis, can have continued to go down. And energy has said, no, we, we're going to have uh, more demand for this. But when you look at energy efficiency, when you look at efforts mm -hmm. that the council's made to try to make homes more efficient, uh, the loads and the usage has gone down over time, so it's gotten harder for Entergy to make the case that you are going to need more power during a peak time. But the opponents have also said, look, you should be looking at solar, you should be looking at batteries that can store some of that energy that comes off of solar. Entergy's response, which the council ended up uh, accepting, was that batteries are not going to do it. This is a 128 megawatt plant, it's gas fired, it's natural gas, and there's really just no comparison on the renewables for you to be able to generate that amount of, of energy on, in a a single in a single fell swoop. Uh, one of the things that Entergy is going to be able to do with this plant is that um, we are now part of a kind of a collective, that uh, 15 state collective, where we can generate power for other states. So if there is demand in other places, mm -hmm. they they may have peak demand. This power plant can be brought online, and then that power can be sold to other areas, and then Entergy. Uh, makes profit off of that, and then that profit is shared back to the energy customers here in New Orleans. But there's a lot of skepticism about whether or not this power plant would actually be more costly the, to, to, to the ratepayers than energy is projected. Kevin, the 
um, distribution issue, though, is a separate issue. And one of the things you hear is, well, Entergy needs this to make more reliable power for you know the New Orleans, for New Orleans, but what does it? How does it deal with the mylar balloon that causes the line to go down, and you know you lose service to a huge area of uptown or whatever? These issues that keep popping up. Yeah, so there's two issues there. There's the transmission, which you got the seven transmission lines. That's like your I-10, all the power coming into the city. Right. And then what you talk about is the d distribution, which is the local, uh, the local roads kind of infrastructure, and that is in really bad shape. I mean, Entergy has not invested as much as they probably should have, and a lot of the argument was. Let's upgrade transmission, let's upgrade distribution, and maybe we can solve some of our problems that way. The council ultimately didn't buy that argument because mm -hmm. the transmission lines, when you've only got seven of them, you'd have to take them down one at a time to upgrade them, mm -hmm. and then that would cause stress and load on those transmission lines, could cause problems there. Entergy has said, look, we acknowledge that the distribution problem is an issue. We're gonna invest in that. They're gonna do $15 million in it this year. Whether that's enough remains to be seen, but. The council ultimately bought the argument that the dis even just improving the distribution system alone was not going to solve the problem. It would have been the transmission issue. And she has said was... that the distribution line, um, it dist stress on distribution will be lessened somewhat with a new plant, right? It could be. I mean, the plant is going to, uh, the distribution plant is a little bit a little bit separate from that because the transmission line is really where you've got the really big gun power coming mm -hmm. in. So the stress on the system would be if you took down transmission lines to repair them or to mm -hmm. upgrade them and then you've got to push some of that power onto those remaining six lines and then that could ultimately, as you said, uh, affect the distribution. This was the council acting in committee. It was a five member committee and there are seven members on the council and he got four votes on the committee. Mm -hmm. So. It seems like this is a done deal in terms of the final outcome. I was thinking about that too, and I spoke to one of my sources who's been working on the opposition on this. She says they're going to keep working in the next two weeks before the council meets. But if you think about it from a practicality standpoint, as you've already you, got the four votes, you've already got the four, so you've got to peel off one of those votes, and then you've got to get the two council members who didn't vote to vote uh, against it as well. And it's just that's just a really tough mountain to climb, I think. Any yeah. other avenues for the opposition to try to thwart this? I mean, they are going to come out with, a, I, we talked about the load forecast, the forecast of how much power we actually use. That's going to probably come out before council meeting. I, that's really the only one that I think that some of the opponents are putting some hope in, that if they're showing that we're, we're going to be consuming less power over the next 30 years than even they predicted before mm -hmm. this proposal came out, that they may be able to convince some council members to, you know, decide against it, but it, it's, it's a pretty tough road right now. When will it come up before the full council? They think that it could come up as early as uh, two Thursdays from yesterday. Okay. All right. We'll be looking for it. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Over to David now, another plant issue. And you've been doing a, a series of reports about an EPA report that said St. John Parish residents are really at high risk because of chemical emissions from uh, the DuPont. What is it? The well, it's, it's now no run by Denka, Denka. so it's, we're calling it the DuPont Denka plant because mm -hmm. actually the facility is owned by DuPont and the operations are run by Denka. But yeah, it's not just that the EPA said it's a high risk, but the highest, mm -hmm. that out of about 78,000 neighborhoods or census tracts is the way that they use it based on census data, but those are essentially neighborhoods. Um, out of 78,000 in the country, the top five for the risk of exposure from breathing the air over a lifetime to cancer are all in St. John the Baptist Parish and all centered around this plant. And the re it's not a new issue. The thing that's interesting is that this plant has been operating there and doing what it's doing now for about 50 years. But the thing that changed was a report came out in 2015 from the EPA based on new understandings of the imp impact of chloroprene. Chloroprene is the chemical that's used to make neoprene, which you see in hoses and mouse pads, and it's, it's a synthetic rubber, uh, wetsuits, things like mm -hmm. that. So, uh, you know, this is a popular thing in most U.S. households, and it's only made one place, and it's there between Reserve and Laplace in uh, St. John the Baptist Parish. So, okay, so the, this EPA report says this is like, the, what you say, the highest risk right. for cancer. What are residents saying to, about this? What is the state saying about this? Well, residents are saying, yes, we're getting sick. We're having rare forms of, Ill rare forms of cancer, rare illnesses. The plant and others say, well, it really only 
causes lung cancer and liver cancer, and you're making a correlation that's not really there. And the state uh, DEQ is saying, well, we've had these permits in place for decades and decades, and they're always coming in under their permits, and we have no problem. And the DEQ secretary, Chuck Carr Brown, actually called some of those residents or the people who are supporting <coughs> them fear mongers for saying that this is that their air is toxic and is 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 killing people. Um, but he says that he is concerned about it because you can't just ignore the EPA findings. And the plant is actually, and, and tonight I'm gonna look at what the plant is doing about this, that they are saying that this is something that they're addressing, that they're going to reduce emissions by a huge amount, 85% and they're going to uh, make things safer, even though they dispute the science that connects the uh, risk to actual cancer. And any kind of data that's out there in terms of the risk and the cancer occurrence. Right, well, they, so there's two different ways of looking at it. One is that the uh, cancer data may not be uh, top notch in terms of the actual incidence of cancer cases. Um, the LSU Tumor Registry provides that information and they gather it from reports from uh, medical professionals when diagnoses are made. But if you're in an underserved community, which a lot of these are that live around these plants up and down this region and particularly right next to this Denka plant, um, are poor and mostly African-American populations. And it's been proven in study after study that there's health care disparities. And the question becomes, are they being diagnosed properly? Are those reports being made to the tumor registry? Then the other way of looking at it is what the plant is saying, is that the science is faulty on saying on what the risk is, mm -hmm. that they're taking results from tests of lab rats and mice and trying to apply the incidence of cancer for them to directly to humans and that they're not using the best science. Okay, a real complex but a very important story. 10 o'clock tonight? Does 10 o'clock tonight and uh, we'll have more coming up. Okay, thanks a lot, David. Over to Don. Street repair in the city of New Orleans. Well, we've talked, Where is it happening? We've talked about this program before. It's, it's Roadwork NOLA. It's an eight-year, $2.4 billion road construction plan that's all a result of a settlement with FEMA over Katrina damage. Um, it was supposed to go gangbusters last year. Bunches of projects starting in 2017. They ultimately only started four of the projects last year because the environmental and historic preservation reviews that are required when you're using federal funds took much longer than anybody supposedly anticipated. But they say 2018's a new year. There will be 55 FEMA-funded projects worth $427 million that get started and in some ca cases <coughs> completed in 2018. One of those that's underway right now is the St. Charles Avenue project that had to stop during Mardi Gras and is back up and running again. Um, it's repaving that street from Felicity to Calliope. They say there's a project in every single neighborhood. It's more than 200 projects. There's not a neighborhood that won't be touched by this repair. But the biggest projects underway right now are in areas many of us might not drive all that often, um, down in the Ninth Ward, on, and then Bullard, and Curran, and Reed, and Meshoot out in the east. So. Um, Two of 13 projects in the Ninth Ward are underway. One of four in Lake Terrace is beginning this month. Um, the Wisner Bridge, they're doing the bike and pedestrian approaches to the bridge that we talked about on this show that was mm -hmm. just completed last year. Bike and pedestrian approaches are about 50% of the way complete. Um, the Magnolia Bridge, which is the bridge over Bayou St. John near Cabrini High School that you often see packed with people during Jazz Fest time. That bridge is going to be closed this month. Um, it will take a year to redo that bridge, resupport it. Um, it will be closed to pedestrian traffic that entire time. So they also have a, a voodoo ceremony every right. St. Right. John's people, Eve. People take wedding pictures on that <laughs> right. bridge. Mm -hmm. There's some famous pictures of Steve Gleason right. on that bridge. That's his wedding. That right. will be shut down for, for a year. I and mean, that's all part of this larger, larger project. The, biggest issue with this project now is that FEMA will run out of funding in 2024 and there is no source been found yet for a, a long-term funding source. So the Cantrell administration is going to have its work cut out for it. Um, 
you know. Don, I like, I like how you said supposedly nobody anticipated how long the historic and environmental right, reviews would take. That they, that that they might take some time. happens every time. Right. And it's, you know, since Katrina, especially with the all the Stafford Act money that we get yes. from FEMA, it all, that, that's always the, the excuse. Now this won't, you know, it, it sounds massive, 200 construction projects. Some of them are, are full-on road reconstruction. Some are just repairs, incidental repairs, streetscapes, kind of runs the gamut. They say it would take more than five billion dollars to actually reconstruct and repave all of our streets and we're working with less than half of that. Yeah. So if your street is terrible, it, it might stay might terrible. Stay terrible? No. Um, you can check out all the progress and see where your street, you can search by your street, by your neighborhood, it's roadworknola.gov, and all the you can um, you can also sign up for weekly updates. So it, you'll get an email on where the construction's happening and where the detours will be. And um, remember, you know, we did our down the drain uh, series, looking at the failures with the sewage and water board, and a lot of this delay for a long time was because of the sewage and water board coordinating with the city and money was going to both agencies and finally they brought it together in right. 2016. Catch Basin Clean Out is updated on there too and it's, it's supposed to all be coordinated. We were talking before the show, you and I, mm -hmm. often it seems like the sewage and water board comes in after the street repair has happened and then the street needs to start needs all over to be repaired again. again. Yeah. Well, it is massive, that's for sure, yes. and it's all over because it, it can be kind of uh, really a it's challenge daunting. sometimes to get driving down our city streets. Two years street, to so. spend half of one percent of the money—that's yes. not good. No, it isn't, David. You're right. <laughs> okay, over to Errol, and uh, you wanted to talk about the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's race. Give us a well, little context. The, here. Um, well, the election is a month from tomorrow, so it's going to probably getting pretty, start getting pretty raucous from now on. Uh, there's going to be a lot of commercials going back and forth. And you're already starting to see it start up already with Fortune Island saying, look, I've been around longer, I've got more experience. Uh, Lapinto saying, well, yeah, but, but you were the public relations guy. Even though he did have uh, some police experience. Lapinto is also having, I guess what you can call the advantage of incumbency, even though he's not elected incumbent. But you saw it last night. Uh, he was on television when there was a story about students texting terror messages. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, and he was there as the sheriff talking about that. And, and so he's got that, uh, I guess, that built-in advantage. One thing that I wanted to mention about the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office is that it's, it's really a, a peculiar entity. It, it is a, an entity separate from the rest of, of, of parish government. Every parish in the state has a sheriff's office. Only in Orleans does the sheriff's office not have the police function. Uh, in Orleans, you used to have a, a civil sheriff and a criminal sheriff. They combined those two after Katrina, but in Orleans, the sheriff is essentially a jailer, and he has some civil responsibilities. In Jefferson Parish, it's like the other parishes, that the sheriff has the police responsibility, but he's also the tax collector. And there's a lot of tax to be collected in Jefferson Parish. It's one of the, uh, the richest and most populous parishes in Jefferson Parish, and, and does a lot of the, uh, the civil work. And so even though people, when they elect a sheriff, they're electing a sheriff based on cops and robbers, that's really what they're interested in. It's a big entity, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of people, and it has a lot of responsibilities. And historically, sheriffs in Jefferson Parish have been political powerhouses. Yeah. I mean, there were some who were the equivalent of political bosses, uh, a guy named Clancy and Cozy, and even Harry, Harry Lee, Lee. Harry, Harry Lee. I mean, they were a big force because they had this big agency that they commanded with a lot of non-civil service jobs, and, uh, and so they had a lot of sway in things politically. Um, cu curiously, there hasn't been a major contested election in Jefferson Parish in quite a while. That was because I think Harry Lee was so popular. He served 17 years. And then when he left, uh, or, or after he died, it was handed off to Newell Norman, who was his designated successor. And, and Newell Norman was, was very, very popular. Um, so there hasn't been what we're seeing now in terms of a, of, of a two-person battle, both of whom claim some legacy to Harry Lee. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fortunato was the public relations guy for Harry Lee. Uh, Lapinto was Neil Norman's guy who's got his job because of Harry Lee. And so there's the uh, there's this Harry Lee specter in the uh, in the background. And also with the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, the, the policing is for the the non incorporated. Yeah, which is an important point because they're making a big thing about what, what the crime rates are in Jefferson Parish. It's very respectable, but the sheriff's office really doesn't have responsibility for all of Jefferson Parish because there are six incorporated municipalities in Jefferson Parish, each of which has its own police department. 
Uh, and so with the sheriff's office patrols, is mostly unincorporated in Jefferson Parish. Now, if there was something in the incorporated areas where they were needed, they'd be there, but their day-to-day -day responsibility, uh, Metairie would be an example of right. unincorporated Jefferson Parish, whereas Harahan and Kenner uh, right. are not. But okay. unlike other parishes, the, the population center is actually in the unincorporated area because Metairie is probably the highest population center, isn't it? Actually, yeah, yeah but Kenner is pretty, yeah, uh, has a large population too. Well. I mean, if, if, Kenner is, is really is one of the largest uh, cities in Louisiana mm -hmm. when you rank them by population. Okay, so election in a month. A month in the morning. Right, okay, thanks a lot, Errol. Back over to Kevin, and you've been doing a series of reports looking into the issue of sex trafficking, human trafficking in our region, and you just did a piece um, talking to a couple of women who had been involved in it. Yeah, and those were really difficult interviews to get. We yeah, started so. this uh, we started this project um, more than a year ago, and it, I knew that early on that uh, there was going to be an issue with looking at sex trafficking because both the history of uh, New Orleans and kind of how New Orleans has developed over the last 20 years as a tourist destination. If you put those two things together, the status as a port city, the history of prostitution, the ability to to draw large events, prostitution is going to be something that's good, mm -hmm. that it's it's hard to deny that it's still here. Now whenever you do see prostitution, I think as a uh, service providers have gotten better at identifying the signs and, and the ways that people are trafficked. Uh, you start to realize that where the prostitution exists, there are going to be people that are going to take advantage of that black market and are going to uh, take control in some situations and use threat, fraud, or coercion in order to get control of women who then become victims and are forced into some of this work. Some of them uh, it, as my story showed, I think both were kind of unwitting in mm -hmm. how they were trafficked at first, didn't realize it until um, they got out of it later. And I think what I really wanted to show with this story was that these victims have voices, these victims have faces, they are in our community. They are people that, um, that some service providers see every day, but because of the nature of the victimization, because of the threats that the pimps and the traffickers um, put in front of these women and, and scare them into what they're doing and, and keep them from reporting, this is something that just doesn't get seen in our community enough. So recently we've seen some raids on, on Bourbon, Street, uh, Bourbon Street strip clubs, um, and one of the reasons was, well, we're concerned about human trafficking. Is are we seeing a link there? Well, I think that's one of the most controversial things about um, the series that we've done and, and also the way that law enforcement has portrayed their efforts to raid the strip clubs. I mean, the, the law enforcement raids involved a, uh, a coordinated effort between New Orleans police and the State Office of Alcohol, Tobacco Control. We had not seen that exist before, and that was one of the issues that we raised in the series, is that there, we, we had not seen coordinated enforcement between agencies, and we had not seen visible and consistent mm -hmm. enforcement, which are, are three things that a lot of experts say are something that you need to do, whether it's in strip clubs, other adult-oriented businesses, or just, you know, even out in the hotels, it's, it's just something that's some, that's that, that we were not seeing happen. And so when they did these strip club raids, they described it as a human trafficking operation. And the people that were affected by the raids, the dancers, the owners, immediately raised their hands and mm -hmm. said, look, you didn't find any trafficking victims when you went in, so how could you call it a trafficking operation? Okay, it's something, though, that's still being closely watched, right? I think, I think you're gonna see some casework coming out of NOPD. They said that they've, um, they've reassigned a narcotics unit to look at these. I, I, the one thing that I would really say here is that I think if you read my uh, the, the the information that these victims provided and you really look at this case, these cases are extremely difficult for law enforcement to make. It takes time. It, they have to build relationships with service providers and right. with these women. So it, it may take some time before we see those good, come to fruition. Good work on your reporting, though. Great series. Thanks. Don. A, a pleasant note, good story. Yes. LSU, women, gymnastics, number two in the, in the country. You have two minutes to talk number about it. Number two <laughs> in the country. They've never won a national title. Uh, this could be the year. Last year they finished second. The LSU gymnastics team is, uh, even Joe Oliva, the athletic director at LSU, says it is a premier sport now women's gymnastics at LSU. They got $12 million from the Tiger Athletic Foundation to buy to pay for a new training facility that's a state-of-the-art training facility. They have Dee Dee Bro as their head coach. She has been at LSU. This is her 41st year. And she came in in the late 70s and just kept pushing and just kept pushing. She is a, a, a little blonde-headed dynamo who just has more energy than, you, I don't know. If you have not been to the PMAC for a gymnastics meet, 
I took my sons and my husband with my daughter last year, and my boys want to go back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very exciting atmosphere. There are, one of the gymnasts said in an interview this week, she said, you know, you look around and there are bare-chested guys with LSU painted on them. It's that much, the student section is full, the band is there. It's really cheap family entertainment, but they are drawing them in and are routinely selling out the PMAC. Um, they have a meet tonight at Georgia, but they're back home in LSU March 4th next weekend versus Auburn. Um, it's about a two-hour commitment of time, and they are dynamos. They have a British Olympian on the team. They have Mary Lou Retton, who was an American Olympian, mm -hmm. very famous. Right. <laughs> Her daughter is on the team. She's injured really? this year. Um, they have a runner-up to last year's Olympic team competing. So it's you know, these are scholarship athletes who are dynamos at their sport, and it's it's worth paying attention to. So this coach, Didi Rowe, is that her name? Didi she's Bro. been there for over 40 years. I mean, she's really obviously done some really great recruiting to establish yes. a great team. Such a, they're second only right now to Oklahoma. Um, it's funny, if, if you look at youth gymnastics to see where the powerhouses are and, and where girls are being built up to be phenomenal gymnasts, Louisiana isn't really in that number. Texas and Florida mm -hmm. really are. Um, but in terms of the rankings right now, you've got Oklahoma and then LSU, then UCLA, Utah, and Florida in the top five. Um, there's national championship in, in March. And mm -hmm. And the other thing oh, about Didi really Bro, exciting. as the name suggests, she's from Louisiana. She is from Louisiana. Yeah. Um, and she arrived, she says she arrived, she knew what Skip Bertman had done with baseball and be able to turn that program around and make it a financial powerhouse yeah. for the school as well as bringing in those great athletes and she's doing it with gymnastics. Okay, congrats so. to the LSU women. Keep it up, keep yep. doing it. Okay, hey, time to look at. Okay, well tomorrow there's a group um, called Soul, which is involved with the urban landscape. He has a project in, 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 in cooperation with Whole Food Mart in, in, in the mid-city where they're gonna plant like 150 trees around the mid-city area and into Gentilly starting tomorrow. Wonderful, David. And Monday, I'm going to have the third and final part of my Toxic Truth series looking at the whole Cancer Alley mm -hmm. and some of these same issues that we see up and down the Mississippi River. All righty. Right. Tonight at Georgia, March 4th versus Auburn and March 17th versus Arizona. And if you have it, these meets are all televised on the SEC network. Okay, because they're selling out, too. Yes. might be the only way to see it exactly. if you don't get a ticket right now. Kevin. We had important developments in the Latoya Cantrell case, card, credit card case this week, uh, or actually today. So um, I would look ahead to see whether or not this looks like it's going to end up in Lori White's court, and mm -hmm. there's going to be some decisions on whether they can subpoena Cantrell's Fi uh, financial, personal financial yeah. records, so that should be a big deal if that, if that case moves forward this okay. week. Okay, thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you all for joining us. Of course, we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. The firm of Bowen, McCled & Britt helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com.